final speaker for today is Dr. Mike Fay. He's one of our incredible radiation oncologists. Um, Dr. Fay is a neuro-oncology specialist and is indomitable in his pursuit of extending treatment options for resistive and tricky to treat cancers. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Mike Fay. Thanks very much, Louise. Thank you. Um, hey, look, I'm sorry about the technical problems. Um, my area is, is um, uh, brain imaging and, and um, trying to come up with um, ways of getting around sort of treatment resistance. So these three pictures here um, uh, of, of a brain tumour, um, you can sort of see... Yeah, I can't, I've got a pointer that's working, but um, is that working? Can you see that? Okay. All right, but look, um, you, let's go to the middle photo. So this is an MRI scan on the left and then a PET scan in the middle um, and then the radiation plan uh, on the uh, right-hand side. Um, and, and these are different ways of, of looking at tumours and they're helping us uh, an awful lot work out you know, what's going on. I'm managing to move pictures around on my presentation, which is not good. Sorry, I'll go to the next page. That go on there. Sorry, guys, I think that this um, PC was from about 1820. Um, <laughs> it's so old. It is so old. It's so old. It's not, it's not mine. But. <laughs> Let's just get out of it. I know this isn't helpful, but... No, that's all right. Um, we can just... Yeah, sorry. Yeah. It's just the next slide. Good. That will go again. Fantastic. Excellent. Okay, I promise I won't fool with anything else. Um, so to our question before, um, glioblastoma is about 1% of cancers. So for every 100 cancers in the community, one of them is a glioblastoma. So it's, not, it's really not very common. Um, but in terms of lost productivity, it's huge. Um, so patients are often young. Um, we, we estimate that it's $50 million a year just in hospital costs. Um, but there's a huge impact, as we all know, in terms of impact on family and carers. So, so the real cost is much, much greater than that. Um, you know, we believe that treatment outcomes could improve significantly. Um, and, uh, and if Steve Ackman blocks his ears, radiation is the single most effective modality that we have. Um, and, and I think that even if we can do small things to, to improve um, the, uh, the outcomes of treatment, that's going to have a significant impact. Um, so, so we have a team um, managing patients with glioblastoma and, and Steve and I uh, work together very closely and, and Kath helps us a, a huge amount as well. So this is, um, uh, 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 I just want to sort of give you an idea of, of what the tumour looks like and looking at it in different ways. So this is looking at what's called gross pathology um, and you can see that there's an area at the back part of the brain where there's little hemorrhages and, and things where the tumour is infiltrating. Then we go to uh, what's called histology. So we take a section of that and, uh, and, and stain the tumour. And we can see that there's these um, blue tumour cells which are sort of invading into the brain. And when I worked in Queensland, uh, we used to say it was like an invading a um, uh, lot of cane toads, you know, sort of heading off into the brain. And, and, and that's very much the, the, way it's, the way it's working. And the, and the edges of this tumour are very active and, uh, and changing rapidly. And then I think Steve's talked a little bit about genetic changes. So this is a way of looking at all the genetic changes. So we've taken that one disease and now we've managed to break it up into a whole lot of different diseases which are all behaving in different ways. And I think this is why this is such a difficult problem to get on top of. So 20 years ago when I was training in radiation oncology, this is the way we'd plan um, treatment for a brain tumour. There'd be an X-ray and you'd line everything up and it was pretty basic and you'd shoot the X-ray beams through, you know, sometimes just two or three beams. But things uh, thankfully got better. We moved to CT. We've got much more um, developed technology now for, for targeting things. And then MRI came along and we could put together um, you know, CT and MRI and get a much clearer idea of where the tumour was. Um, and then PET scanning uh, came along and that uh, enabled us to look at not just where the tumour was, but whether it was active. We've been doing quite a lot of work in this area to, to try and integrate all these different types of imaging and give us different views into uh, what's happening in patients' brains. But something's holding us back. Um, and uh, uh, 
so, so, so we um, set up a study to try and look at um, what was going wrong with the treatment um, and we um, had a, a bunch of patients who helped us an awful lot and went through a huge number of scans for us uh, and we started to get some sort of clearer idea. So this is a sort of standard treatment where you have surgery and then you have radiation and chemotherapy with temozolomide um, and then you followed up after that. And, and what we've sort of landed on, are, there are sort of four things that, that go wrong. Um, and that's that the pressure in the tumour is too high. Um, there's quite a lot of variability in the tumour cells. There's not enough oxygen in the tumour for the treatments that we've got available. And all of this ends up in the tumour being much more able to mutate, what's called hypermutation. So um, we did some work with the CSIRO and uh, it constantly amazes me how smart some of these guys are. Um, but what they were able to do is take an MRI scan and turn that into a map of pressure inside the brain. Now the problem with the brain is it's in a box um, and the box doesn't expand. And so if the tumour starts to grow, it um, starts to increase in pressure. And then the tumour for some reason gets uh, new blood vessels to form, which are sort of little tubes. But it's a little bit like having a dodgy plumber. Um, the tubes form but they start to leak. And that sort of fried egg that you can see on the left hand side, so you can see there's a white bit in the middle and there's a dark bit around it, that's all fluid that's accumulating in the brain. And you can see it much, much easier on the flare sequence in the middle, so you can see the big, big white spot. So what the guys at CSIRO did was looked at the MRI scan and, and worked out what the differences in pressure were. And you can see with the same patient, that red area or the white hot area in the middle is where the highest pressure is. So we've got something that's um, sitting there in the brain and it's really hard to get drugs and things in there because the pressure's quite high. The other thing is uh, um, heterogeneity, that the, um, the, the tumour starts to be a whole lot of different um, parts. So there's parts that are quite active, um, there's parts that are dead, there's parts that are uh, you know, just sort of sitting there waiting to, 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 you know, to do something. And we started looking with different types of MRI and different types of PET scanning. The trouble with the PET scan that we use mostly, which is a, a, a marker called FTG, all of the brain lights up, so it doesn't really help us with brain cancer. So we have to get the, um, the imaging agent from Melbourne. It's, it's made once a fortnight on a Thursday, um, and it gets flown up. But with COVID and everything, the flights were sort of decreasing, and it was getting really hard to, to get access to this. So we started doing some work with a type of prostate imaging, which doesn't sound at all related to brain cancer. But it turns out that that prostate imaging also lights up brain cancers. So the image at the bottom um, is, is using uh, a tracer called PSMA. Um, and, that, and what we're finding now is that this is uh, a much better imaging agent for us to use because we can make it in Newcastle. Um, we don't need a whole lot of fancy equipment and, and it doesn't have to come up from Melbourne. And so this is helping us know whether the tumour is alive and, or dead. So in terms of changing the treatment pathways, uh, if we can sort of do a, uh, uh, do a clinical trial and then look with imaging, then we get a much better idea of whether it's working. Um, now, sometimes what you see on the MRI scan is not the bit that is really causing the problem. And this is a, a patient that we scanned in Brisbane um, who uh, has a tumour that you can see uh, with MRI scans, your legs are coming out of the um, screen towards you. So left-hand side um, uh, is the bit without the tumour, right-hand side is the tumour. So you can see that there's a, a, white, a white bit of uh, tumour at the bottom, um, but when you had a look with, with uh, PET imaging, actually most of that bit at the back is dead and the really active bit is in front of that. So we're sort of dealing with a moving target. Um, even when you think something looks like it's involved on scan, that's not always where the tumour's actually active. Um, and the, um, the, the, the next bit that we started looking at was, was um, what was happening with oxygen in the tumour. Because when radiation goes into a tumour, it has to have oxygen there in order to cause damage to the tumour and, and cause it to die. And the problem with high pressure is that the oxygen starts to go down and the tumour becomes quite resistant. So we, we did a study with um, a, uh, a, a, a pet agent called uh, mycinidazole, which shows us where there's low oxygen. And what we found was that when there was an area that had good oxygenation, the tumours you know, went away really well. 
But when there's an area that's quite an, got active tumour and low oxygen, that was a really bad combination. Um, and so this, um, this shows that sort of uh, picture here. So we've got... Um, actually, you're looking at a different picture from me. That might be more helpful. Um, so when we've got a, the, the situation um, with, with the cross beside it, um, there's an active tumour that you can see the sort of black dot, but then also there's low oxygen. That's a particularly bad combination. So we think that all of these things kind of play in together um, and it makes a sort of environment where the tumour can start to mutate. And the problem with it mutating is it becomes more and more and more different. So it becomes almost another disease. Uh, and the treatments that might have worked um, for, for the disease earlier on can stop working. And you know we would see this commonly um, with chemotherapy that patients respond for quite a long time to chemo and then there comes a point where things don't respond. And sometimes that means that patients are then resistant to any sort of treatment. So look, we desperately need new treatments. Um, the Mark Hughes Foundation's done a fantastic job locally with encouraging research and helping us get a lot of this stuff done. Um, things are starting to move forward. Um, it's not quick enough, I know that, um, but uh, I really think that we've got a great opportunity in the Hunter you know, to, to uh, uh, move the, the whole field along and um, the reason I was late this morning was uh, not that I was slacking around cat. I was uh, at a meeting at the university talking about how we can start looking at some more genetic work in this area. So, yeah, thank you for your support. Um, uh, I think this is uh, a really, a really important area of oncology, um, and there's lots more to do. Does anyone have any questions for Dr. Taylor? Sorry, I'm running away too quickly. Hello. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Um, you mentioned hypoxia and the use of oxygen during radiation. How do you deliver that oxygen when you're you know, doing that? How does, how does that work? Yeah, look, that's a really good, um, really good question. Um, I, I sort of didn't mention oxygen um, because the problem is it doesn't get in there. Um, so when I used to work at Peter McCallum in a previous life, um, they had a, a, a hyperbaric chamber um, which they would use to increase the pressure. So if you increase the pressure of all of the body, then you can force oxygen in there. The trouble is when you do that, you can only get a very small window that you can run the radiation beam in through. Um, and so the outcomes were slightly better, um, but the technical difficulty of getting the oxygen up was really, really difficult. So it's basically like a decompression chamber. You have to put the oxygen in, increase the pressure, and then treat the patient while, while that's all happening. Okay, thank you. There are probably other ways to do it, um, and one of the treatments that Professor Acklin uses a lot is, is Avastin or Bevacuzumab that I think he probably talked about earlier and that um, decreases the leakiness of the blood vessels, kills off these abnormal blood vessels and stops the leakiness. So we think that you know, some of these treatments can be sequenced in a better way and if we've got better ways of looking at how patients are responding, then we can make those changes to the treatment paradigm. Okay. I, have, I have another question that I've prepared <laughs> it relates to sodium valproate. Is anything further happening with that? And yeah, what yes. is your latest thoughts on that? So, so look, um, uh, we've done a bit of work on what's called drug repurposing um, because we think there's lots of these drugs that have been designed for one thing and actually probably have more general uses. Um, Valparate looks interesting because it works on DNA unravelling um, and so it keeps the DNA in a, in a form that's more able to be hit by radiation. Um, we've done a small study um, and, and certainly we had some, long, some quite good survivors in that group. Um, I don't think it cured anyone, but it sort of looked like it was helping. The literature's a little bit, you know... Uh, well, it's, it's, people aren't sure about it. Um, it. It's the problem with... Uh, so the problem is basically that they've done a reanalysis of a whole lot of trials and looked at whether patients were on Valparate or not. The trials weren't designed to look at the question of Valparate, and then they've assumed that because it didn't show an improvement that there's no benefit. But actually, it's that the wrong study was done. So, um, yeah. But look, if, if it's helpful for seizures, you know, I think it, it, we've certainly seen some improvements in survival. Thank you. Thank you all again. Thank you.